É, a gente tem hoje mais um evento da série USP Lectures, que a gente tem feito acho, nos últimos dois anos, trazendo pessoas importantes aqui na universidade para falar dos mais variados temas. Hoje a gente tem prazer especial de receber uma pessoa muitíssimo bacana. E espera só um segundo que eu preciso... É, a nossa palestrante de hoje tem um mestrado em engenharia é, elétrica e de computação, é, o doutorado em engenharia de sistemas, é, professora na Oakland University e acabou ficando bastante conhecida por um MOOC do Coursera, que deve ser o um motivo pelo qual vocês conhecem, que é o Learning How to Learn. Então, tenho um prazer enorme de chamar aqui no palco para dar uma palestra para a gente, depois ficar um pouquinho para responder as nossas perguntas, a professora Barbara Oakley. Palmas. I'm so honored to be here. This is fantastic. What an incredible university. I just Professor Krieger, thank you so much for your invitation and and Okay, so I should begin by letting you know what it looks like for me when I'm going to work at my day job. So that's me. I, I live in Michigan, which is in the center of the United States, kind of in the north. And I'm, I, I teach this course, and it happens to be the largest massive open online course in the world. So uh, we have just passed the two million registered students mark. My co-instructor in this MOOC, it, that's Massive Open Online Course, it's abbreviated to MOOC, right, is a fellow named Terence Sanowski. He's the Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute. And he, well, here's Terry going to work at his day job, right? <laughs> So how do two such completely different people get together? Well, that's one of the great advantages of online learning. Not only can students come together from all over Brazil or the world, but even the instructors themselves can come from very, very different backgrounds. Now, as it turns out, I was invited to speak at Harvard. I was a nervous wreck. Here I am. I mean, I'm just I'm a little Midwestern professor, right? I'm just an engineer. And I, so I go to Harvard, and I walk in. It's a big room. It's completely packed, filled, standing room only, all around the edges. And I thought, why are there so many people here? And it turns out it's because our one little course made for less than $5,000 US dollars, mostly in just the basement, a little room in our house, had on the order of the same number of students as all of Harvard's MOOCs and online courses put together, made for millions of dollars with hundreds of people. So uh, I, I remember once I asked this fellow, He'd had a MOOC, right? And I asked him for a little advice about how to make a MOOC, because it was very popular, and his MOOC. And he said, well, tell you what, why don't you talk to my producer? And I thought, producer? This guy's got a producer, wow. <laughs> so I, I call his producer, and his producer says, you know, I had 20 people working for me. So you be prepared, you're not going to sleep. I'm like, 20 people working for you? I mean, it was, it was my husband and I, you know. And, so actually, the interesting thing is, you can do this kind of thing. It's actually really doable in your basement with just a few people and at much cheaper prices than people can think. And it's super, super helpful, very helpful for students. Now, the thing about online learning is that it's highly competitive. It is a mixture of academia with Silicon Valley and all combined with a little bit of Hollywood. 
And there's actually nothing wrong with that because the Hollywood is what brings you in, attracts you emotionally to what's going on, and people absolutely love it. For an example, so this, this as it turns out, is our older daughter. <laughs> so you might wonder, you're like, how do you make this course so cheaply? Well, part of the reason we can make it so cheaply is because whenever I needed an actress to do a little video vignette, I'd, I'd go ask our daughters, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so here's our daughter, and so I needed her to model the idea of blocking out sounds so that you could learn them, uh, learn whatever you're learning uh, with more focused, more focused attention. As it just happens, she has this huge pair of earphones on her lap, right? So at the time, she was a third year medical school student. And I, I so she went to class, you know, about, about a year after the MOOC came out. And she was sitting in class with 75 other students and she was being taught by a preeminent cardiologist in southeast Michigan. And he's teaching away, you're teaching, and he suddenly stops the class, points right at her and says, you, you are the girl in the MOOC. <laughs> so here's this distinguished, advanced professional who actually was taking an online course because he got so much benefit out of it. So we think that online courses could never be as good as face-to-face. -face. But actually, it's a statistical truism to say that half of all teacher, teachers are below average. <laughs> so what that means is you can have really, really good teachers giving the greatest lectures they've ever gotten in their life, and students can greatly benefit from this. Now, now, you might look at that example and think about that example and say, oh, well, sure, you know, some elite professional, sure, maybe they can benefit from this kind of thing. But actually, other people can benefit. There's whole pockets of society that we often don't even think about that can be helped by online learning. So here's an example of this. So this is me. I'm standing with a group of individuals who all have IQs of 70 and below. And what these individuals previously could look forward to in their life was being, show, being in a warehouse. Basically, they could maybe fold napkins. But they took the videos for learning how to learn. They learned about how their brain works they now think of themselves as learners. Many of the things that we're going to talk about today, they can tell you about. They've used them, and guess what? They are, for the first time in their lives, doing the impossible. They are attending college. So th there is extraordinary benefit for society that can occur through the the benefits that these new and very inexpensive uh, ways of teaching can, can allow for us. Now, I should switch gears a little bit. So that's an introduction to online learning and a little bit of background about the course, but I should probably give you just a little bit of background about me. Now, I grew up in the US, and I grew up kind of moving all over the place. In fact, by the time I hit 10th grade, so I was about 15 years old, I'd lived in 10 different places in the U.S. Now, this is, where this can cause problems is, oddly enough, when you're learning mathematics. <coughs> mathematics is extremely sequential. So if you, that's great if you get every part of the sequence, but let's say that you didn't learn a certain mathematical tool when you were in fifth grade. For example, you didn't learn to divide. It's hard to be successful going up after that. Well, when I was seven years old and we were moving from Lubbock, Texas to Chelmsford, Massachusetts, well, suddenly they were way far ahead of me in the multiplication table. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh man, she's a professor. She's standing in front of us, right? So she's brilliant. So she just caught right up. Nope. 
That was not me, right? I, I didn't like math. I wasn't that good at it. And I just thought, oh, I can't do this stuff. I'm, I'm, I must not have the math gene. I'm kind of stupid about it. So I just flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science. And, you know, it really is kind of ironic because I'm standing here in front of you today as a professor of engineering. <laughs> and I'm the real deal. I mean, I publish in top journals and I... And so one day, one day, my, one of my students found out about my terrible past as a math flunky. And he said, how'd you do it? How'd you change your brain? And I thought, how did I change my brain? I mean, here I was, I was just this little kid, and I like to show this picture of me because it's like the last cute picture of me. <laughs> so, but I, I loved animals, and I liked knitting and weaving and all that kind of thing. And I was completely convinced that technology and math and science were completely out of my, my playbook. So I thought, what's left for me? Well, I was very curious. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could learn to speak another language? I mean, I grew up in a resolutely monolingual household, and you can guess what language we spoke. <laughs> and, and I thought, wow, I, I really want to learn another language, but how can I do that? I mean, there, there wasn't an easy way to watch videos or go online or anything like there is now. And I couldn't afford to go to college to study a new language. But I found out there was one way I could learn a new language and get paid for it. <laughs> and, and that was to join the army. <laughs> <laughs> so there you see, I, I'm looking really nervous about to throw a hand grenade. And if, if you knew how clumsy I actually am, <laughs> you would know why I look so nervous. <laughs> But I did learn another language. I learned Russian. I ended up working out on Soviet fishing trawlers up in the Bering Sea. And I just loved seeing the world through new perspectives, right, with new eyes. And I thought, well, you know, why don't I, I I'll go to the South Pole. So I ended up at the South Pole Station, right? And, and that's where, incidentally, I met my husband. <laughs> so I, I always say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that man. And, and, and he, there he is, right there. <laughs> uh, so 33 years later, smartest move I ever made, right? <laughs> but, but the thing is, I, I began to realize that here I was, 26 years old, I was about to get out of the army, and there, for some reason, recruiters were not like banging on my door saying, you, we just got to have your Russian language skills. In fact, nobody wanted, really, there was very few jobs available. And I began, I mean, we know that culture and society are incredibly important. They always will be. But increasingly, math, science, technology, all of those kinds of matters are also important. And I thought, why don't I see? I mean, I'm supposed to be open to new adventures, right? Why don't I see if I can maybe change my brain, right, and learn math and science? I remembered I would open the books of the West Point engineers I worked with in the military, and, and I'd look at it, and it would look like a foreign language. <laughs> and I thought, you know, aren't I supposed to be open to these things? Shouldn't I be able to learn this language? So at age 26, you know, getting out of the military, I went back to the university, started with remedial, call, or remedial high school algebra, and began to slowly retrain my brain about learning in math and science. And it was not easy. But if I'd known then what I know now about learning, I could have made it so much easier on myself. I remember, I would, I would, if you look at my books from back then, they had, they have these dimples in the pages. Why are there dimples in the pages? It's because I'd, I'd 
work, I'll work, I'll work. And, I, and then I get so frustrated, I take a fork out and I stab the page, right? <laughs> and, but how many of us have similarly felt frustrated when we were trying to learn? Or, or if you're a professor, how many of our students have felt this way? So back when that student asked that question, how did you change your brain, I thought, you know, I'll write a book about this. You know, I like to write books, so I'll, I'll write a book. And I, um, so I wrote up a manuscript. Now there's something called, it, it's in the United States, it's called RateMyProfessors.com. And this is a way you can go online and you can learn about how good professors are as teachers. So, uh, so I went to rate my professors and I downloaded the top two to three hundred professors of chemistry, engineering, mathematics, economics, physics, uh, even uh, psychology, English, and so forth. I emailed them all and I, these were top, top teachers, often also top researchers. And I asked them if they would look at the manuscript for my book. Shocking percentages of them said, yeah, I'll do that. So I got all this feedback. And here was the interesting thing. There was like this shared secret handshake amongst many of these professors. They often used metaphor and analogy as their key, their secret for communicating ideas more easily and more effectively. And they would share this to me as a secret handshake. They'd say, you know, I don't like to talk about this because other professors give me a bad time about it. Why would other professors give them a bad time? It's because the other professors thought they were dumbing down the material by making it more understandable and easier. But we now know from neural reuse theory that if you first activate a, a set of neural circuits that involve the metaphor, you can use those same circuits to begin much more quickly and easily understanding the in-depth mathematical or analytical or abstract concepts themselves. So, so that, I thought that was fascinating. And I also reached out to top cognitive psychologists, top neuroscientists, and I myself have taught for many decades, for several decades, in engineering as well as done research in engineering and in an education within that field. So what I'm going to be sharing with you here today is some of the best of what I found about how we learn effectively. So the brain, as we know, is enormously complicated. But fortunately, we can simplify its operation to two fundamentally different modes. The first, I'll call focused mode. If you're uh, a psychologist, you might be more familiar with this as task positive networks. So focus mode is when you're concentrating on something. So for example, you might be looking at me and trying to focus and think about what I'm saying. But there's another mode of thinking and I'll call it diffuse mode. Diffuse mode is, it is one of the 24 or so neural resting states that we're aware of, the most prominent of which is called the default mode network. The diffuse mode is what happens when you're not thinking about anything particular. You're just daydreaming, your mind is wandering, you're thinking, the thoughts are there, but they're, they're kind of jumping around from place to place. Very radically different network than the focus mode. So to understand these two different modes a little bit more deeply, we're going to use a, what are we going to use? Come on. Do I hear it? Metaphor, I heard it, yes, yes. We're going to use a metaphor and the metaphor is that of a pinball machine. Now if you're of a certain age, uh, you'll know how a pinball machine works. <laughs> and all you have to do is pull back on the plunger, a ball goes boinking around, and it, it bumps into these rubber bumpers, and that's how you get points. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that pinball machine and we're going to put it right on the human brain. So are you ready for it? Yeah. 
Okay, there we go. There's the human brain. And there you can see there's the nose, the little ears, and here's the brain itself. And here we go. There is the pinball machine on the brain. Now this is an analogy for the focused mode of thinking. In this mode, you've got these rubber bumpers, but they're very close together. So, so often what happens in focus mode is you've got these patterns you've already laid. So let's say most of the kids who were in that third grade when I moved in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, they had the patterns laid for multiplication. And, and what happened though is it, it, I didn't have that pattern laid, so I didn't know how to think about those ideas. But normally, for you, for example, if you know some multiplication, and I, I asked you to multiply 24 times 35, what would you take out a piece of paper and you might multiply it out, and your thought patterns would move smoothly along those patterns that have already been laid. But what if you're trying to learn something completely new? So let's say that you know multiplication really well, but you haven't studied division yet. It's kind of like this. It's like, it's like there's going to be a pattern somewhere else in your brain, but you don't know where it is, you don't know how to get to where it's going to be, you don't know how it's shaped yet, and you don't even know how to put it there. So how do you learn something new? Well, it seems that what we do is this. We'll, let's say you know multiplication, you're studying division, and so you start division by going to the wrong pattern. You go to the multiplication pattern, or you kind of default to that, and it doesn't work very well. You get a little frustrated. In fact, you get a little more frustrated, and then you take the book out and you get the formula. <laughs> so, so, but it, so, so when you do that, you, you get frustrated and you close the book, and you walk away, and it's when you walk away that you open this completely different neural network, the diffuse network. Notice how far apart those rubber bumpers are. Those, see, see the, the magic of the diffuse mode is your thinking is more widespread. When you think a thought, it can range much more widely before it hits a rubber bumper. So you can't think in a fine and detailed way as you can when you're in the focus mode, but you can at least get to the new place you need to be in in order to begin solving a problem. So learning often involves going back and forth between these two different, very different modes. And in fact, when you're, as long as you're focusing on something, you can be blocking your diffuse abilities to look at the problem. So you're working harder and harder and harder, and you're like, no, I don't want to give up, right? That means I'm not being persistent. It's, it's a shame on me, but actually you need to stop in order to open this other mode of thinking that works on the background on the problem. Now, you, so as it turns out, when you're learning, you go back and forth between those modes, and that's because you can only be in one mode at one time on that subject. Unless, you know, there, there is a way to be in two modes, but that involves taking mushrooms, and I'm not advocating that, right? <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so learning is this back and forth kind of thing. It's almost like, uh, like lifting weight. It, it takes time because you're going back and forth. And when you're lifting weights, you, you'd never develop that kind of muscle structure like learning one time, right? Uh, or, or, or lifting weights one time. You actually have to, you, you um, lift weights, then you rest and your muscles are kind of building. Then you lift again and then you rest. And, and it's, it's back and forth between work and rest that allows you to win championships and so forth, or just learn something new. So I think there's a good analogy there. Now, what I want to do, though, is I also want to take another little step back. And I want to show you, uh, when I began this talk, I, I talked about massive open online courses. 
And I think it's powerful for you to see how can these kinds of ideas be conveyed in a video. Well, look here. I, I'm showing, I'm discussing some of the same thoughts. I can actually walk into a metaphor and show you some of these ideas by, by physically being within the metaphor that I'm trying to convey. I mean, this is in some ways even more powerful than what we can do in class, especially when a student can sit and really focus and they're not worried about you know, the students flirting in front of them or the professor kind of getting a little lost because they don't know things. This, in fact, uh, online learning, these kinds of well-made videos can be very compelling and just a lot of fun. So what I'd like you to do now is I would like you to, uh, I would like you to team up. So what, what I want you to do is hopefully turn to someone who you've never met before. And uh, so I know you're probably sitting with a friend or something, but try and turn and make a new friend. So introduce yourselves to, to the person you've never met, and I would like you to uh, discuss the difference between focused and diffuse modes. So you'll have two minutes to do this on your mark, get set, introduce one another, go! Okay, if you can hear me, raise your hand. It works like magic. <laughs> so this was actually, for those of you who are thinking about becoming teachers or who might be teachers, notice what happened there. When we stopped for a minute and I said, take your focus off of me and turn to the other person, you know what you did? Momentarily, you went into diffuse mode. You switched attention, and, you, and that little slip into diffuse mode helped you to begin processing the ideas in a different way. 
And so this is part of why what's called active learning can be very powerful in the classroom. So you get up, you teach the material, but every 15 minutes or so, you have a little break where they actively somehow master or work with the material you've just been teaching. Particularly, okay, now I hate to admit this, but you may have noticed that some science, technology, engineering, and math courses are boring. <laughs> So if you have little active exercises like that, it can really help liven things up and make things much more interesting. Research has shown that, if, that in these science, technology, engineering, and math courses, one in three students will fall out if you use the traditional teaching methods. That means you look to your left, you look to your right, one of the three of you is going to drop out. If you use active methods in the classroom, these kinds of things, like just what I just did, only one in five drops out. That's much fewer. So it, this is a very, very good approach to, uh, to learning. And, uh, and part of it is that, that different mode of thinking that it helps you do. Now, you may think, well, you know, the University of Sao Paulo has just done it again. They've got another one of these theoretical professors here who comes up and tells us this stuff that sounds fantastic, but is not, it's actually very theoretical and we can't do it in real life. I mean, think about it. You've got to take your time, go back and forth as you're learning something new and difficult. Who has time for that, right? Especially if you like to do something called procrastination. <laughs> Now, what is procrastination? It is putting things off, right, to the future. And, and so you don't have to do it right now. And it, it, as it turns out, it, in the course Learning How to Learn, I have discovered that procrastination is the number one issue in learning all around the world. And what I hear from learners in the course is the one simple trick I'm about to tell you, is so profoundly helpful that it's actually often changed their lives. So what is this trick? Huh? So when you even, first let's talk about what procrastination is. When you even just think about something you don't like, it activates a portion of the brain that experiences pain. <laughs> so the brain, naturally enough, looks for ways to stop the negative stimulation. And here's what it does. So procrastination is just a habit. You know, couldn't be a good habit, bad habit, right? All habits have good and bad aspects. And what happens is this. You, you, you think about something you don't like to do. It kind of activates these feelings of pain. So you turn your attention to something else, and the result is you feel happier almost instantly. <laughs> Now, you do this once, you do it twice, no big deal. You do it very often, and it is procrastination, and it can have serious long-term consequences in your life. You can even think, or your students can think, I cannot do this subject, and it has nothing to do with whether you can do the subject or not. It all has to do with the fact that you've procrastinated until the last minute. And of course, nobody could do it in that kind of last minute uh, condition. So I'm an engineer. I'll cut to the chase. What is the most important tool you can use to, to tackle procrastination? It is the Pomodoro technique. Now, this technique was invented by an Italian, Francesco Cirillo, in the 1980s. And to, it, it is so incredible, incredibly simple. All you have to do is first you turn off all distractions. So no little ringy dingies on your cell phones, right? Nothing popping up on your computer. And then you set a timer for 25 minutes. I have a little timer that's on my, my laptop. Some people will uh, download Pomodoro apps, so they've got a timer on their, their uh, cell phone. And then all you have to do is work 
for 25 minutes. Focus as intently as you can for 25 minutes. Now, if you're like me, here's what I'll do. Set my timer. I've turned off all the distractions. I'm working away. I work. I mean, nobody can work harder than me. I'm just like really focused, you know. And then I, I look up at my timer, and I've just done two minutes. <laughs> that point of, and my mind screams, I can't do another 23 minutes. But then I, I let that, it's like Zen, like meditation. I let that thought flow right on by and I return my attention to whatever I'm focusing on because anybody can do 25 minutes, right? So I do that 25 minutes and here's the most important part of the Pomodoro technique. That is rewarding yourself. So what happens is if you, if you build in a little reward when you're done, then at the end, then it's almost like Pavlov with his dogs. He, he, the dogs, they would ring a bell and it'd be a few minutes before they'd get the reward. But the dog would be salivating, really enjoying that. I mean, they're really looking forward to this food that they're going to get. And you can kind of train yourself a little bit that way. If you know you're going to get a reward, you will actually enjoy the attention process more while you're while you're doing a Pomodoro. So you are training yourself to enjoy focusing and you're also training yourself to enjoy the relaxation part of it. And we always used to think that the only time you were learning was when you were focusing. But now we know that learning also takes place when you're relaxing. When you, that, that's when your brain is consolidating that information. So if you think that the only way to learn is by focus, focus, focus all the time, every spare second in the day, you, there's some evidence that that can kind of cr kill your creativity. It's best to go for a while. For me, if I do a Pomodoro and it goes longer than 25 minutes because I feel like working, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. I'll, if I'm in the flow, but when I'm done, I make sure that I reward myself. And I do that in a lot of different ways. I might uh, listen to a favorite song, go surfing on the web, get up and have a cup of coffee. Uh, Brazilian coffee is really good. <laughs> uh -uh. So the only little tip I have is don't focus on finishing a task. So if you're sitting down for 25 minutes, don't sit there and go, I'm going to finish this entire homework set or I'm going to finish grading all these quizzes because that's thinking about the task and that activates the pain centers. So you don't want to do that. You just want to say 25 minutes, that's my goal, I'm going to do that, I don't care what I'm doing and that will avoid your sneaking past your brain's pain centers. Now learning effectively is a lot like baking a cake, baking a really good cake. It, you might ask, what are the ingredients for a really good cake? Well, there are lots of ingredients for a really good cake. You got, you got the butter, you got the, the sugar, the flour, the eggs. You, you got to get, get the right temperature, the right pressure. There's so many different ingredients and learning is just like that. When you're learning something, there's lots of different ingredients to learning something, being able to learn well. And one of those ingredients is sleep. <laughs> and now, now I know what you're thinking again. You're like, my mother told me that. Why do we have to have a big professor up here telling us that sleep is important? And it's, it's because your mother was right. Sleep is very important. But your mother probably didn't know why sleep is important. And sleep is, and we just recently have discovered why sleep is important. It can help you understand why you want to take care of it. And when you learn, or, or when you're going through the day, this is, these little circles here are my analogies for neurons. So as you go through the day, what happens is metabolites, little poisons accumulate in your neurons or right around your neurons. And these little toxins, you might think that these, this cerebral fluid, like the, almost like the water, can wash them away. But 
the neurons are too big. They're like boulders, and they block the path of the fluid. But when you go to sleep, your brain cells shrink. I really like this part, so I have to do it again. <laughs> so when you go to sleep, your brain cells shrink, and that allows the cerebral fluids to wash those toxins away. So that's why when you get a good sleep, you wake up in the morning and you're refreshed. If you, if you say, I'm going to get two hours of sleep before my big test, you're essentially guaranteeing that you're taking a test with a poisoned brain. And no matter how hard you're studying, you can destroy all your previous efforts if you don't get a good sleep. So there's another reason, though, that sleep is so important. And that relates to, well, you can see by this incredible image here, this is, there's a new technique called light microscopy. And with light microscopy, you can image, you can see living neurons. So this is a living neuron before, before learning and before sleep. And this is the exact same living neuron after learning and after sleep. So you can see, for example, here, there's a new dendritic spine that is grown. Everywhere where you see these yellow triangles, there's new neural connections. Those dendritic spines, those little spikes that stick out, are new synoptic connections. In other words, they're new wiring that's growing in your brain because you've learned and you've slept. So that's another reason that sleep is so important, is because it's when you do the the upgrading, the rewiring of your brain that occurs with, with new learning. So this is why it's important to space out your learning. Do a little bit every day, and or most days, and as you do, you'll see that the patterns get thicker and richer as you learn. If you don't do that, if you just sort of... Uh, uh, um, Learn all at once. Let's, let's see here. There we go. No. I'm going to go back just one more. There we go. Okay. So you're cramming all in one day, right before the test. And then what, that, what happens is your patterns aren't that strong, and then your little metabolic vampires can more easily suck those patterns away. So a metaphor to help us better understand this is... The, the idea of a brick wall. When you lay the bricks, you lay the mortar in between and you let the mortar dry before that wall gets too, too tall. If you don't do that, your wall looks kind of like this. It's really uh, not a very good foundation for your learning. So this is why sometimes students, at the beginning of a semester, they'll cram and it works well because it's easier material. But as the material, as you go by and the semester gets more and more difficult, they begin to struggle because a lot of their patterns have disappeared. They were poorly laid because they crammed and there's nothing, there's very poor foundation to build on when they get further along in the semester. So, so this is why sleep is important and practice over multiple days is important. But there's another uh, related matter of learning that we often don't think about, and that deals with exercise. Now, exercise is, well, we used to think that you're born with all the neurons you'll ever have, you get older, they die off, you get dumber, and then you die, and it was really depressing. <laughs> And fortunately, it was dead wrong. We now know that new neurons are born every day, especially in the hippocampus, which is an important area for learning and memory. And this, this mouse was, this was one of the earliest studies, in fact, the earliest study, that showed that exercise is a very important, critical component of being able to learn more easily and effectively. So this mouse was being taught to differentiate between these two different patterns, and they studied the mice's uh, the, uh, brains, 
And they found that, see, these blue blobs indicate old neurons. And the red streaks, they were able to, to image those, and those are the new neurons that are, are born. So old was blue, red is new, and they found that mice that were allowed to exercise had a lot more of those red new neurons. Exercise actually promotes the growth of new neurons, and new neurons are what help you to learn new things. So many, this study was done uh, several decades ago, but many, many studies have been replicated or, or have shown this and built on these ideas since then. And we now know how important exercise is as part of the learning process. In fact, if we could take that chemical that we get from exercise and put it in a bottle so you could take it in a pill form, we would all be billionaires in this room because <laughs> it's so effective. But, but one thing I want to point out, you probably can't quite see it, is there's a person's name there is Terence Sanowski. Remember him from the very beginning? He was my co-instructor in the MOOC. And he was uh, a co-author on this paper. And when we were making the massive open online course, my husband and I went out to California to film, and Terry kept talking about the importance of exercise. And I was like, exercise? Come on. Okay, Terry, tell, tell, tell it to me rightly. Do you exercise? Terry's like, exercise. Do I exercise? Well, next thing you know, we're, we're over on the beach of San Diego. That's the, one, the, the beach you saw at the very beginning. He climbs down, there's like uh, a 100 meter cliff every other day or so, and off he goes for a run. I love how this ends up here. Yeah, uh, Terry doesn't just read the literature. He reads it, he takes the best ideas, he incorporates that into his everyday life, and we can do that too. So, so let's move to another area of learning that I think is very important uh, in relation to all of your abilities to learn. And that uh, that relates to the idea of memory. Now, there were, for our purposes, we're just going to talk about two little things, right? Uh, two aspects of memory. Long-term memory, which you kind of know what that is, and short-term, or working memory. Now, working memory, we used to think, researchers thought that we had something like seven slots in working memory. We could hold seven numbers, say, seven things in our working memory. Now we think it's more like four things, four slots of working memory. If I haven't had my coffee yet, maybe two slots <laughs> in working memory. So, so when you're focusing on something, it, you can almost imagine it's almost like an octopus that if it wants to, it can reach down through those slots of working memory and connect into long-term memory, patterns in long-term memory. So how do you get something from working memory into long-term memory? The best way to do that is just through practice, right? You, what you're doing is you're making neural connections, you're forming patterns in the brain. And the more you practice, the stronger and richer those connections will be so that when you try to think of that pattern, it comes back to mind. So it's a little bit like this. You, you first practice with a new idea. The more you practice, the deeper and richer that pattern gets. Now this brings me to what I think is the most important point of this entire talk. And that relates to the idea of chunking. Now, when you first even look at something, you're trying to figure it out, it's almost like a puzzle. And your working memory is going a little crazy. And we can see that in neural imaging. Your working memory in your prefrontal cortex is like going crazy. And, but once you've figured that pattern out, whether it's a a puzzle piece or whether it's a, uh, a complex equation that, that begins to make sense. It's almost like you've created this ribbon. So instead of having everything going crazy in your working memory, you've got this ribbon 
that you can pull up into working memory that, that makes everything all easy because it's this practiced pattern, right? And then the other parts of working memory are free. Now, let me give you a good example of this. So this is our younger daughter, Rachel, right? So we're sitting around the dinner table and I'm asking the girls, okay, I need someone to model backing up a car really badly. And my younger daughter's like, Mom, I'm the one. I can do this, right? So, so backing up a car is actually really quite difficult. When you think about it, now watch, she's, she's backing up the car and look at her little face. I mean, she's like, does, does she look in the front mirror? Does she look in the back mirror? Does she look behind her? No, no, she said, wait, no. And then off she goes into the ditch, right? So, so what's happening is when she was first learning to back up a car, it was a little bit like her brain was still in this mode. She hadn't created a pattern yet. And, and she, do you look forward, backwards, whatever? But once she had learned how to back up a car and she had practiced with it, then she could, whenever she would just think, I'm going to back up a car, she could just pull it right up to mind, that ribbon, that back up a car ribbon. And then with the other slots of working memory, she can talk with her friends or maybe listen to the radio. It's all free, right? She can do that kind of thing. We now know that any kind, the development of any kind of expertise involves the creation of these neural chunks, these kinds of ribbons, well-practiced patterns. So you can think of it as these kinds of patterns. And as you become an expert, you develop a library of these chunks or ribbons or patterns that you can easily pull to mind and make new connections with as you're learning. So what professors often like to do is connect a couple of very different ideas. Well, if you've, uh, if you've learned the subject very well, you can see a connection between this pattern, right, and this pattern, and you can connect them together, even rapidly on a test, because you're very familiar with those kinds of ideas. But sometimes students, what they'll do is, they'll sit down to a test, they haven't studied very well, and it, they're, they're actually, when they sit down to, to do the test, they're still in this mode. So that it all seems like, I don't know this. I, and then they think they have test anxiety, when actually it isn't test anxiety. It's that they haven't really properly studied and created good neural chunks. They've maybe skimmed the material, but not put it inside their brain by actively working with that material. So, so sometimes some of our very best attributes we think are really bad. So I'll, I'll give you an example of this. Sometimes we think having a poor memory is a really bad thing. Um, I'm here to tell you that having a poor memory is a really good thing. Now, here's why. Remember how I talked about those four slots of working memory? Some people have like steel trap, right? They, they, whatever you put in working memory, they got it. And other people, you know, you got those four things in working memory, they got it there, you know, woo, shiny. <laughs> they get distracted and something falls out of working memory. But research has shown when something falls out of working memory, something else comes in. And those individuals, again, as research has shown, have very good propensity for creativity. So do you have to work harder and longer sometimes to keep up with the people who have a steel trap memory? Yes, you do. But you would not want to trade it, right? Because that, that steel trap, or that having that, that kind of working memory that loses things also helps you to be more creative. So it's a good tendency to have. So another thing is sometimes some of us are slow thinkers. And uh, 
like in my classes, I'll be asking about Bayes' theorem and I'll ask some deep question about the statistics involved. Before I can even get the question out of my mouth, there'll be somebody in the front row already got the hands up, right? They've got it all figured out, did it all in their head. Well, what is there for the other students in the class? You're, you're not even sure you really have questions yet, right? So, so the thing is, some people have race car brains. They get to the finish line really fast, intellectually speaking. Other people have something that is more like a, a hiker brain. They get to the finish line much more slowly. But while they're walking, they can reach out, they can touch the leaves, they can, they can smell the pine in the air, they can see the little rabbit trails, they can hear the birds. It's a very, very different experience than the race car driver. And in some ways, it's even richer and deeper. So my hero in science is a man named Santiago Ramon y Cajal. He won the Nobel Prize for, uh, for his pioneering breakthroughs in uh, neuroanatomy, and he's known as the father of modern neuroscience. And what Cajal said, I think, is, is very interesting. He said, I am no genius. He said, and he wasn't. He, I mean, he would stumble over words. He couldn't understand things very quickly. He had a terrible memory. But he said, I am persistent. And when the data tells me I am wrong, I can change my mind. I'm flexible. He said, I've worked with many geniuses. And the challenge with geniuses is they grow up really smart. They're used to being right. They will often, as a consequence, jump to conclusions about what is right. They're not used to being wrong. So they're inflexible in the face of data that tells them they're wrong. And they charge ahead using their intellect to support something that's actually incorrect. So if you are not a genius, and you're more like a hiker brain, you can still rejoice because sometimes you'll be able to see and do things that even the geniuses cannot. Now, as we're wrapping up, I, I just want to allude to a couple little things. How can adults learn, change, and grow even when they're older? Ah, good, good question, eh? Well, here it is. <laughs> Video games. <laughs> uh, uh, there's great research out that shows that action-style video games are really healthy for your brain. And in fact, there's, uh, I was just meeting with Adam Ghazali, uh, Ghazali in the last week, and some of his work was published in Nature, fantastic evidence uh, that, that doing certain video games can be extremely effective in helping build your attentional mechanisms. So what it's doing is improving your midline frontal theta, your long-range theta, theta coherence. In other words, your working memory and sort of the connecting abilities between different parts of your brain that you need when you're trying to focus are enhanced through the playing of, of certain action style video games. So it's, um, it's a really, uh, um, so if you're thinking video games are all bad, they're not. <laughs> they, they, it's just like anything, food, uh, exercise, whatever, you can, they can be overdone and you can become a little bit addicted to it, but actually in moderation it's healthy. And I'll give you just a quick little uh, sense of what, what a typical video game, there are many different kinds of styles, but this is from Brain HQ, which is one of the best uh, by Mer Mike Merzenich, uh, because some of them, there's no good research evidence that they're very effective, but this has pretty good research behind it. Now watch these three dots. No matter what happens, keep an eye on those three dots. A little hard, right? <laughs> Now, see, and there's, there's the three dots. So these kinds of uh, brain training uh, exercises can be beneficial. Now, another, just as we're wrapping up, I just want to bring two ideas of, uh, that can help you overcome illusions of competence in learning. So remember those student that comes up and says, uh, I really knew the material. I just suffer from test anxiety. <laughs> That's because they were fooling themselves that they were learning. And 
that so easy to do. The, the best, let's say that you're sitting down and you're trying to study. So you're reading some material. As you're reading it, which one is best? You, you um, reread the material, you underline or use highlight, or you use concept mapping. Which one do you think is, uh, is best? Okay, so how many think underlining is best? Okay, we got one. And how many think that uh, concept mapping is best? Okay, and rereading. Okay, so the concept mapping has it by, okay, so I was tricking you, because actually it was none of the above. <laughs> um, recall is the technique that's best. It's even better by far than concept mapping. What is recall? It is simply reading the material, then looking away and seeing if you can recall the main idea. If you want, you can make a little note or something like that. But don't reread it. It tricks your brain. Don't, you know, even concept mapping isn't as good as just looking away and seeing if you can recall the same material, the, the most important point. That doesn't just, it, it isn't you memorizing it. It actually builds your understanding of the material. So the other uh, really valuable uh, thing to remember if you're trying to prevent illusions of competence in learning is testing. Test yourself on everything. Make little flashcards for yourselves. Sometimes poets will say, memorize the poem and you will understand it more deeply. If you're in math and science, why should you let the poets have all the fun? <laughs> right? Memorize some equations and it will help you to understand some of those equations more deeply. But, but the more you can test yourself on everything you're learning, like if you're learning something from chapter four, then test it out with chapter three material. Do you know the difference between those? Can you work the problems cold? Sometimes we'll, we'll turn in homework and we'll just do the problem one time. Would you ever sing a song and say you knew how to sing that song really well? No. You want to take some key problems and internalize them so you can work them enough times that you could actually work it in your mind cold. And that builds a neural chunk that helps build your understanding. So in closing, I would just like to allude to the idea of passion. We're often told, follow your passion. And that's what I did. I followed my passion and I learned Russian and I got out and I met the real world and the real world didn't really care what my passions were. <laughs> so I think it is important to follow your passion. I mean, you don't want to lose that. But you also want to be aware that sometimes your passions, you know, you want to make a connection with what's really going on out there so you're not blindsided. So, so with following your passions, you want to, well, just remember that following your passions is, is kind of a double-edged sword. Passions develop about what we're good at. And some things just take much longer to get good at. So I always say, don't just follow your passions. Broaden your passions and your lives will be greatly enriched. Thank you so much. Well, I should mention the course is free. If it comes up and says, you know, pay something, you don't have to do that. You can just watch it all for free. So, uh, so enjoy. And uh, there is a book coming out, and we are working together towards the possibility of uh, creating some great online materials uh, for kids that would be uh, learning how to learn. And uh, I'm really excited about the the visionary nature of the individuals working here at Sao Paulo, the University of Sao Paulo. You are amazing. And again, it's a great privilege for me to share today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And I can't stress out enough how much we're privileged and honored to have you here. This has been great, amazing experience. 
And now we're going to open uh, to the audience so they can ask some questions. Uh, excuse me, just to switch to Portuguese for a second. Então, gente, se alguém tiver pergunta, a gente tem mais uns um 20 minutos, meia horinha para fazer algumas perguntas. Vou pedir para ser bem breve para dar chance do pessoal fazer o máximo de perguntas possível. E se tiver é, se tem alguma dificuldade, precisar que a gente traduza para inglês, é só avisar. Isso, e se apresentem, por favor. Fala de onde que é. Well, thank you so very much, Mrs. Oakley, for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm sure everybody here appreciated very much your hints and tips, and your very storied life was a motivation for all of us who like to, who would like to become long, lifelong learners. My question actually is regarding uh, the whole subject of MOOCs. Uh, recently, a uh, senior official at Udacity which was responsible for the first uh, nominally accepted MOOC, uh, said that MOOCs are probably dead because uh, they haven't catched up to the demands and the dynamics of the online age as much as its proponents first defended. So uh, they're now saying that they're scrambling for new formats that would fit and answer the needs of students more properly. Uh, I would like to ask you if you think that assertion is correct, and if so, do you envision how we could tailor the educational experience better uh, to suit the students uh, in the digital media as opposed to you know, a, a seminar room? And if so, how can we make a better use of the resources that computers and internet and multimedia allow us uh, to employ into uh, your educational experience. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Bruno from uh, the Business Co. here at USP. Thank you for your excellent question. Uh, I think first off I need to point out that when the, the spokesperson from Udacity was making that statement about MOOCs being dead, keep in mind that all of their competitors are making something called MOOCs. <laughs> right? So if you want to you know, try to diminish what your, your uh, competitors are doing, you just say, it's all dead. But it, the reality is that Coursera, for example, which is the largest of the online course providers, is now in the unicorn territory uh, as far as funding. So it's valued around a billion dollars. The investments alone tell you that MOOCs are not dead at all. In fact, they're thriving. They've gone from several hundred, maybe five years ago, to over 7,000 today. Uh, people are, are they're, they're vibrant, they're alive. In fact, Udacity itself has some fantastic uh, cooperative ventures going on, for example, with, the, with Georgia Tech that are, <laughs> just revolutionizing how education in computer science and data analytics is being conveyed worldwide. So uh, I think that was a bit of hyperbole to sort of disenfranchise competitors uh, that's not in any way reflective of what's going on in the... Um, there, there's actually there's big money in MOOCs and I think part of that involves the fact that when you make education great education available um, for many people, you have extraordinary economies of scale. In other words, you make great stuff available really cheaply. And uh, people are, are noticing, investors are noticing that. And I think that's part of why there's so much interest uh, in this. And if you, uh, if you go to Inside Higher Education and just type in Arshad Ahmed and Barbara Oakley, you'll see our rebuttal article to uh, that particular statement and so forth. So inside higher education, and uh, I think it's a, that article went sort of viral, uh, our, our article, so I think you'll see a good rebuttal that goes into far more detail.
Tá, trocar de lado faz uma vez de cada lado. Eu... Próximo aqui. Hi Barbara, my name is Gustavo Belchior. Congratulations on your great talk. Really oh, passionate. Um, I am a biologist in biochemistry and now I have a science communication company and it is dedicated more towards um, bringing scientific knowledge to companies, which is sort of a different environment from traditional learning and teaching. So I'd like to ask you if you know any particular strategies for communicating science to more of a business or corporate environment and also how do you see the future of science communication in the next maybe 20 or 25 years? 30 years. Thank you. So, uh, another very good question. The, if you're able to come to tomorrow's uh, six hour or so workshop, you'll get a lot of ideas about how I think the future will be changing in scientific communication. I think a lot of it involves, videos are just awesome. They're a very compelling way that can grab a person from many different perspectives, from, from hearing, from seeing. You can almost feel like a wind rushing by as there's a special effect that does this kind of thing. And so it's a way of communicating ideas that's far more effective than simply through writing. And also, of course, if you're writing for a journal publication, you can't use things like metaphors. Uh, you'll get in trouble. Your reviewers will say, how dare you do this? Um, and, but if you're doing a quick elevator version of, of what's going on in a paper, you can use videos and use these ideas to really quickly convey these ideas uh, so that people can understand them very well. So I think the future, uh, in a nutshell, I think the future of um, scientific communication will involve even more video and there's lots of little tricks you can do to make your videos more compelling, more interesting and metaphor of course is one of the best ways to reach people about difficult scientific ideas and make them very simple. So for example this idea of focused and diffuse modes you'd be in your third or fourth year of college generally uh, to understand those ideas, yet you can explain them to 10-year-olds using some of these same uh, approaches on a video, and you can get kids ahead a lot more quickly with, with what's going on. So uh, those are just my thoughts on that. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Eduardo. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. It was quite uh, interesting. Uh, my question is, uh, you said in your presentation that uh, you like to write books. Uh, when did you write your first book? Uh, how many books have you, uh, did you write? And uh, about which topics? Uh, it's oh, do I have to answer that question? <laughs> uh, uh, I think I've written what, maybe nine books now. I, I tend to write all over the place. So uh, I wrote, my first book was about working on Soviet trawlers, so it was really hard to get it published because it involved all this drinking, right? And the publishers were like, oh, we can't seem to be, you know, promoting all this drinking. And it was like, it's what the Russians did. But uh, So uh, anyway, I finally got that book published. And then uh, I, I published this book. Okay, this is a totally tongue-in-cheek title. It's called... Evil Genes, Why Rome Fell, Hitler Rose, and Ron Failed, and My Sister Stole My Mother's Boyfriend. <laughs> uh, and so you're going to laugh at this, but I sat for about six years. Uh, actually, my sister really did steal my mother's boyfriend. <laughs> and I was wondering, why did she do this? Right? Why do people do this kind of thing? So I thought, I want to really research why do people... Some, Sometimes they're nice and sometimes they're really mean. Not like psychopaths that are, you know, pretty much always mean, but like sometimes they're nice, but sometimes they're not. And, and I couldn't figure out, how do you research this? I mean, I can't go to PubMed and say, I'm going to type in mean, right? And I mean, nothing's going to come out for research. So I found out that this word malignant narcissism, this term, was often used to describe people who were sometimes kind of mean. And... I found out that thousands and thousands of psychological studies had been published on this 
And not a single one of them had a scientific foundation whatsoever. And I got really interested in what was going on in the field of psychology, that, that sort of part of it could go adrift, and all this stuff could be published with no foundation, really. I wrote, wrote that book about it, and it got great um, blurbs from very distinguished psychologists like Steven Pinker and very well-known psychiatrists. And, and it was hard because I spent six years, you know, who's going to read an engineer's take uh, takedown of what's going on in parts of the field of psychology? Well, it went to 40 publishers, and finally one little publisher picked it up. Uh, but it, got, it did really well because it was well-researched. And then I, I got fascinated by why do, you know, not just why did people do mean things, but why did people do, um, you know, all the people who were following Hitler were not bad people, right? So why do good people get, do bad things? And so then I, I began researching the pathologies of altruism. Uh, did a, uh, you know, a edited volume of that, did a, um, uh, science, or just a popular book called Cold-Blooded Kindness, Neuro Quirks of a Cold-Blooded Killer, right? Uh, uh, and uh, so I uh, just have written a lot of books about a lot of different topics. But the last one, <coughs> uh, or I, I wrote about the serial killer. And you know what? It is not fun to write about serial killers <laughs> uh, uh, or people who have the possibility of being, they, they are not nice people. And so I thought, you know, I should probably turn to something a little bit more lighthearted, <laughs> interesting. And so I, I thought, you know, that student asked that question, how did you change your brain? And I thought, oh, I'll do a book about learning. And I didn't realize all the other previous work was relevant to that. So, uh, so if you write about lots of different topics, they can all kind of build and come together in very, very interesting ways. And I think a lot of times I don't know what I'm thinking about something until I write about it. That's when I learn what I'm thinking. And other writers have said the same thing. So, uh, so it's not like I love writing and I just got to do it. It's like I, I have to do it. You know, it's this compulsion, and sometimes it's wonderful, but other times it's just like, boy, that's just awful. Uh, and I have to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it, but uh, it can be a, a wonderfully fulfilling when you find that it does work. So uh, that's sort of my, my writing story in a nutshell. Thanks. Um, here, uh, me. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm terrified to talk in English, but I will try. Uh, my name is Ivy. I'm a veterinary student here at ULSP. And I, read, I write a, a text to, to make this question, but I, I will really try to, to get short. Uh, I want to talk about feelings when we are learning. And when I'm terrified of some, some subject I'm studying, I block that. And I can, uh, even I stop and while, and when I come back to, to focus mode, I block my mind and want to run away. In medical school, it, it, it is even worse. I, maybe I can kill someone. So <laughs> I, the, this method of get focus and, and give it uh, some time, when I, I, I feel fear, it doesn't work. And we can build tools to help students to av avoid this fear of subjects and, uh, when we are studying and get more self-confident. Maybe games can do this? I think you have to be a little bit careful with games. Uh, sometimes here's what happens. This is an excellent question. Um, I go to... 
uh, STEM conferences, science, technology, engineering, and math. And there are presentations everywhere about how to make STEM more entertaining, more fun. You know. And that is a little bit like, I'm going to teach you how to play guitar by, by having you play air guitar all the time. You, I mean, you feel great when you're doing it. You love it. Uh, but you're not really learning how to play the guitar. A lot of times when students, what happens is students go through their educational system and at the lower levels, at least in the United States, there's a lot of emphasis put on the idea of making science and math fun. So what happens is they get to college and they hit calculus and all of a sudden it's the math and science death march. Everybody just falls off, right? Because it's not fun anymore. And we've taught them that math and science needs to be fun. So I think it's a little, that it is better to teach in this way. You, when you're first riding a bicycle, you're learning how to ride a bicycle, it's hard. You got, well, you got to pay attention to this, this. Oh, well, you fall over, it hurts. There, there's pain involved in learning almost anything that's new. And especially if it's a little hard. But as an adult, I mean, or as an older kid, you can just jump on your bike and fly at once you've got those basic skills. So learning in, in math and science is a lot like that. It's, there's a tough entry level, and if you just kind of help students do it, you get through it, just like scales, uh, learning how to play scales. Kids never have a problem. If they want to learn how to play a musical instrument, they're, they're not going to have... Uh, be upset if you say, well, you've got to practice and use some scales, because they know that that's involved. But we don't tell them the equivalent of that in doing math and science. We're always kind of like, if you're not enjoying it, there's, it's not your passion, so you should do something different. When actually, eh, it's just like anything. It, 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 there are parts where you have to practice, and then the joy comes. So um, I think that many times... Uh, we were trying a little too hard to make everything all really fun and nice, but actually, for example, the Chinese look at what we do in the West as far as math, and it's a joke, <laughs> because they, they know that it involves a little bit of effort uh, and, and learning some things really well through practice, and I think just a little more of that is okay for us to be doing as well. Those are just my thoughts on those. So really tough question and a good question. Hi, um, my name is Luis. I study geology here in USP. And first of all, I want to thank you. The uh, presentation was really good and it helped me out some things to study. And uh, I want to know um, about some other ways at other methods of uh, studying like acupuncture, or electrode methods that maybe uh, make uh, faster the way to learn. You know, any knowledge of that? Um, so is the question then, are there faster ways to learn? Yeah. It, um, learning involves growing those new neural connections. And that is, it takes work. There's no magic formula, much as we would like it. S sometimes there's ways to become intently focused on things that can help. Using a little bit of uh, intent focus with breaks helps. Uh, so all the kinds of things that I've spoken about today are ways to help you get intently focused when you are focusing because that helps those little dendritic spines emerge and make those connections better. But we don't have a magic formula yet that will help those spines grow more quickly, except for exercise will help with that. Uh, so you know, right now it's still more a question of turning your attention to it and really working as hardly, hard as you can, but it's not necessarily going to make um, if you want to learn calculus super fast, uh, y y it's probably not going to be as fast as you would want it to be. We don't have the, the, the tools yet to make that happen. So I think just one more question. 
Hello, uh, here. Hello, I'm Ariane. I study electrical engineer at Poly here, and I'm part of a group and we study artificial intelligence. And I would like to know if you see some kind of connections about machine learning and our human learning. How can I can we use it? machine learning? I don't know to improve our human learning. I think that uh, machine learning will help make dramatic improvements in our regular human learning. Let's say you're learning statistics. Right now, you turn in a homework set, and maybe it gets graded, and you get it back in another week or so. Wouldn't it be much better if you got your results instantly, if you took a test instantly? Uh, at, or turned your homework in and you learned immediately what you had done wrong and then you were presented with something that, that gave you the same question in slightly different format to really make sure that you got that idea. Uh, this kind of uh, adaptive learning is coming. It's, it's going to change and, and adapt to the, your weaknesses and help build them into strengths. So, uh, and it, this isn't a terrible thing for teachers. It's a wonderful thing for teachers because what's one of the, what's one of the worst burdens we have? It's grading. Grading can be really, really time-consuming, tedious, and boring. And if you've got some grading help that can allow students to you know get instant feedback and learn very quickly where they've made the mistakes, uh, I think that's an awesome thing. And that is definitely coming. It's not here yet. I wish it were here because it would help the students in my classes. A big thing in this is we often, or an important point is we often think that students, if, if you flunk a test, that student is a little demoralized and you flunk several tests and you just think, I can't do this subject. When, what if we had it so that you could take that test over and over again? And it changed, and it, it helped you to actually learn the material. And so then we didn't have this on off of, oh, no soup for you. You, you, know, you didn't learn this material, so you can't uh, pass this class. Instead, you could uh, just learn through the testing, and uh, that's a great way to learn. Research has shown that. So I think we have a bright, bright future ahead with applying artificial intelligence to learning. And that's not good. That's going to help not only students, but also teachers to relieve some of the burden of grading. Sadly, we're out of time, but I want to really thank everyone for coming. This has been a great meeting. And one important um, notice is that Barb is going to be with us tomorrow as well, hosting a workshop that's going to go from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it would be excellent if you're available to join. She's going to give us very interesting insight on how to build MOOCs and how to learn to use tools for better online learning and teaching. So a round of applause for Barb again, and thank you everyone for coming. Se conseguirem chegar cedo amanhã, melhor, inclusive, quem puder ver.